uh, Nicholas's brother. When Nicholas uh, abdicated the crown, he abdicated in favor of Michael. Um, Tsar Michael was imprisoned in the city of Perm. Uh, so he was a, a character that walked across the stage of history very briefly uh, and disappeared and became um, just a figure that came and went. But it's an interesting story as to exactly what happened after that. Uh, 25 pages of that story are uh, here. Uh, you may not all be interested in this, reading 25 pages about this thing. It, it's pretty much a uh, riches to rags story. Uh, his wife died in Paris in 1952, uh, living in a garret in, pa in poverty. And this more or less chronicles how that all came about. There aren't a lot of copies of this because to make 25 copies on my computer on double-sided printing is a bit of a drag. So if you really are not too interested in it, just pass it along to somebody else. But if you are, it is an interesting story. OK, now, uh, I'm a subscriber to The Nation magazine. And in, uh, in uh, the issue that came to the house on March 3rd, in the back, there were um, uh, hold it up to the camera. Okay, I don't know if you can see it or not. But in the back of the uh, of the issue, there was a review of four books on uh, the Russian Revolution, the Gulag, etc. And one of those books was by um, Alexander Rabinovich. Alexander Rabinovich uh, writes. He was, I think, published by the Indiana Press. And I thought that the uh, the reviewer, now, for those of you in South County, I'll bring this down for you next week. Uh, the reviewer went over this story of the revolution uh, with his own twist on it. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Now, here we are in 2008, and I'm talking to this class about this, these events of almost 100 years ago, and still historians are debating and considering exactly what happened. Now, Rabinowitz has some interesting ideas about uh, what happened in the revolution. He particularly points out that the Bolshevik party at that time was um, not monolithic. There were many, and I've talked about the many disputes that went on, even the dispute on whether to uh, revolt or not, whether it was the right time or not. And the, discussions still go on. So I'm going to pass this around. I invite you all to take a copy of this. This is the review that appeared in the Nation magazine about a month and a half ago, uh, a review of a book by uh, Alexander Rabinowitz. OK, now there's one more thing I want to bring up. OK, when I started my lecture here three weeks ago, I passed out an introduction to uh, Medvedev's book, The Let History Judge. And uh, I said that I wanted to bring that up. Now, normally, in a normal class, where I'm not going from one class to the other, I would save this all to the last lecture, uh, or the next to the last lecture. But this is the next to the last lecture I'm going to give here in Pittsfield. The next time I come back to Pittsfield will be the last lecture here. And I ask you to consider why this um, Soviet revolution failed. Why did it fail? And there were six questions. So I'm going to pass this out one more time, because the next time I see you here in Pittsfield, I want to talk about it, and I want you to have read this and considered these questions. And when I come down to South County next week, I'm going to bring these back to you down there. And my last lecture will be in South County. And I'll again bring up the subject. I would like to conduct this dialogue on why this revolution failed in a person-to-person -person setting, as we have here in Pittsfield today, and as we'll have in South County um, the day we bring it up. So. Uh, that's the, the setting for this. Now, before I begin talking about the struggle for power that we're going to talk about today, are there any questions or anything anybody wants to bring up 
both you fellows and people down there in the South County and up here. Anybody have any questions? Okay. So there's nothing more appropriate to what is going to happen here than this quote by Engels, because they have the revolution. They're in power. Now the problem is what to do with the power. And there's many, many problems, as you can see from this, and even more so from this quotation from Nikolai Bukharin. Okay? Uh, we used to see the problem, we gain power, we take everything into our own hands, introduce a planned economy. It's a real engineer's view about how this is all done. Give some of the recalcitrant odds and ends what for, they're essentially the gulag, I guess, is what I'm talking about and subdue the rest, and that would be that. But that's not what happened. As a matter of fact, Nikolai Bukharin ends up being killed in the purge at Walter, along with a lot of people that you'll see in the story today. This is a game that's going to ensue that's similar to, in some respects, to dynasty, you know, like a corporate fight for power. Except this is a game where you fight for keeps. If you don't win, it's too bad. OK. During the Civil War, the, um, the question of grain, the question of feeding, was essential. During the Civil War, one of the uh, missions that Stalin had, he had many missions during the war, but during the war was to go down to Tsaritsyn and see that the grain is delivered to Moscow. But all of this war and all of this killing, and as you see here in the, la in the bottom bullet, 700,000 people died in Samara province alone during this crisis after the war. The total loss of life due to famine following the Civil War was 5 million. The 1 million in the aftermath. The devastation is unimaginable. Imagine something like that happening in our country. Or proportionally, it would, it would be staggering. OK, the peasants are resisting the levies. This is traditional. This probably went on in Roman days, but that always goes on. Half the peasantry is starving. Naturally, after that horrible civil war, everything has is, is been turned up. and. Uh, Lenin is having a hard time trying to keep this program going, trying to keep, uh, to try to uh, institute communism in a, in a situation like this, it became impossible. Why am I not getting the next slide? Where is my next slide? Okay, okay. I'm going backwards or forwards? Forward. Forward. Okay. okay, so finally, um, you have a situation where Kronstadt, Kronstadt is a naval station in uh, Petersburg, St. Petersburg, then known as Petrograd, now not then finally known as Leningrad. And these were the people who supported the revolution, these uh, sailors. These sailors were bought over food riots. This was an eye-opener. This was the flash, <laughs> says Lenin, that lit up reality. We have to do something about this. We have to forget about trying to uh, seize grain. We have to forget about uh, trying to impose communism. We have to allow capitalism back. And it was called NEP, the New Economic Policy. Stalin was not a, a contributor to this, but as you can imagine, among the Bolsheviks, there was contention about this, this new NEP. Uh, one of the... Uh, problems that they had was that Marx had predicted that in order to have a, a communist or socialist uh, government, you had to have capitalist accumulation. And that was the, the function of the capitalist phase of uh, history. Uh, his theory of history was that feudalism is followed by capitalism, capitalism is followed by communism, and in the capitalist phase of history, you have wealth accumulated. And so Russia, at this point, had not accumulated enough wealth. And the theory was that we have to go back to capitalism to accumulate enough wealth. I'm going to divert a minute here. 
Uh, when the NEP was instituted, uh, Bukharin uh, famously uh, declared to the, uh, uh, to the peasants, enrich yourselves. Uh, don't hold back. And that was to encourage them to plant and for uh, grain to be produced. I don't know how many of you remember this, but when the um, Chinese communist leader, uh, I forgot his name now, after Mao, declared enrich yourselves, he declared it to the Chinese peasants. And uh, I think it was Deng Xiaoping. Right. Now that was a call for the a form of NEP. They gave up communism, and they have still given it up in the, in the pursuit of capital accumulation, capital accumulation. And I think the current, I think, the current uh, pundits and uh, experts on China look upon this as a permanent move. But I myself, having studied this period in Russia, and being aware of the NEP, I'm very suspicious of the Chinese move to capitalism. I see in this a, and I could be wrong, and I'm not really advocating, but I'm just throwing it out for your own contemplation as a form of NEP. These Bolsheviks instituted the NEP as a temporary move to satisfy the uh, need for uh, Russia to accumulate capital. And we'll see when Stalin comes into power how the NEP is brought to a close. But if I'm right about all of this, there's somebody waiting in China to do a similar thing. But I hope that I'm wrong. In any case, uh, war communism is replaced by uh, the NEP, and it comes into play. And this uh, famine crisis is uh, temporarily ameliorated. Now, I told you that uh, uh, Fania Kaplan had shot Lenin in 1918, and the bullet had gone in and was lodged in the back of his neck. Um, in 1921, he begins to complain of headaches. The bullet was still in his body. Uh, he had been working, as it says here, um, furiously uh, for, uh, for many years. One of the things to remember as we look at this thing is uh, the first clip I showed you where the doctor told Stalin that uh, he has to rest. Uh, told him that he's got a heart condition and he has to uh, take it easy. And Stalin mutters to himself, that's what they told Lenin. Okay, so this incident, this, uh, Lenin will die in 1924, but this is the beginning of Lenin's incapacity. And this haunted Stalin um, and appeared again at the end of his life. A great fear about being in a condition that we'll soon see uh, Lenin passing into. And it's also true that, that Stalin, at that point, at the end of his life, had been working virtually without a break. The only rest that he had was the time he was hiding from Kerensky in uh, Alilubi's uh, shed, that's uh, Stalin's father-in-law, in uh, his shed back in the backyard and had uh, slipped off to uh, Finland for some uh, months. Okay? <coughs> now, this term, the gray blur, this is Trotsky's characterization of Stalin. This is what Trotsky said about him. Um, Trotsky tried to paint Stalin as a uh, faceless bureaucrat. Actually, that's not very fair. Uh, Stalin was an accomplished person. There's no question about that. Whatever we think about him as being a son of a bitch, he was certainly accomplished. And he wasn't only a bureaucrat. He had been around in the Civil War. Now look at all the jobs that he had. He was a member of the Revolutionary Military Council. During the Civil War, he was on almost every front that they were fighting against the whites, doing a variety of different things and very active not hanging out in an office up in uh, Petrograd while everybody else was out fighting out in the field. He was the Commissar of Rapkin. Rapkin is uh, an English uh, uh, word for uh, what was called the inspectorate. Uh, that was like a, an auditing, like um, 
the general uh, auditor of, uh, of an agency. He was auditing everybody. Uh, he was a member of the Politburo, a member of the Org Bureau, which was the organization, and he was a chairman of the Secretariat. So he was in the middle of everything as nobody else was, even more than Lenin. A mistake. What do you think the mistake is? What do you think the mistake is? Yes, the mistake is this. Underestimating, underestimating Stalin's power as a result of patronage. All these things people owe him. There was a small Bolshevik party that now had control of this vast country. How are they going to do it? They needed more Bolsheviks. They needed more people in the party. And Lenin decreed 200,000 more people had to be brought in. And who was in charge of bringing it in? It's a dull job bringing in people. Stalin was in charge of that. So that all this recruitment, all of this promotion, all of this new mass of people coming in, they were all beholden to Iosif Vizoranovich. Here he is at this period with his uh, wife, uh, Nadja. This is Nadja Aliluva. Um, She's the daughter of an electrical worker that he had met in the Caucasus. Uh, her, one of his uh, secretaries, one of the guys, uh, his assistants, a guy named Reddins, uh, fell in love with Nadja's sister. So uh, he now had a brother-in-law in this uh, family, uh, Reddins, uh, Red, uh, uh, Anna, uh, Alleluia's husband, uh, Reddins. Uh, he also had a, Another brother-in-law, his first wife's brother, um, uh, the Spanazzi family, who were raising his son, Yaakov. Uh, with, uh, with Nadja, he would have two children. Um, the, the, the son's name uh, slips my mind, but the, uh, his uh, daughter was Svetlana, and we all remember Svetlana. OK? All right, now these were Trotsky's jobs. Trotsky never was in the Bolshevik party. He never had, he was in the Bolshevik party, but he never had a, a, a post. He was a member of the Politburo, which is a government organization. He had come into the party just before the revolution, sometime in July or, um, or April of 1917. This tremendous thing is Trotsky's book on the revolution. Trotsky was a prolific writer. This is only one of many, many books that he wrote. Look at the tremendous size of this book. This covers the period from um, uh, the abdication of the Tsar in the beginning of 1917 to the revolution uh, period in 1918 in tremendous detail. He starts out this book and saying, oh, the author was a participant but uh, I'm going, this book is going to be objective. Well, it's hardly objective, but it's certainly very, very well written. I just want to give you some, uh, some excerpts from it. Uh, he's an excellent writer, a, a, an outstanding uh, intellect. Uh, we just went on to another picture. This is a picture of Trotsky and taken in 1909 uh, during the revolution that failed. There's something about this picture that's very, very um, revealing. His attitude. This man, this photograph is taken of a man in a jail. He's in jail. That little peephole on the top, that's the door to his cell. So does this guy look like an ordinary prisoner? Just look at the way he looks at the camera and look at his whole pose. This was the kind of person he was. I will just read something to give it a flavor of his um, of his rhetoric. He's talking about the, um, the 1917 February Revolution. Uh, it's, I called it a coup d'etat, but he doesn't think so. In every factory, in every guild, in every company, in each tavern, in the military hospital, at the transfer stations, even in the depopulated villages, the molecular work of revolutionary thought was in progress. Everywhere, were to be found the interpreters of events, chiefly from among the workers, for whom one inquired what's the news, and from whom one awaited the needed words. 
blah, blah, blah. And it's very, you could see this kind of drumbeat of uh, revolutionary fervor in his uh, writings. And then as far as his objectivity, here is his characterization of, um, of Tsar Michael. Michael Alexandrovich has tried every way possible to avoid interfering in any affairs of state, devoting himself wholeheartedly to horse racing. Uh, then he goes on to say, uh, um, Michael was an anglomaniac without making clear whether in the matter of horse racing or parliamentarianism. And he, he has uh, uh, many jibes like that about uh, people throughout his, uh, throughout his book. Now, I can't say that I had the patience to read this entire book, although I have it in my library. I've used it for reference and material. Stan, when, when did he write that? Well, he was in exile. Uh, they kicked him out of they didn't kick out. Stalin forced him out of Russia in 1929, and uh, he had time on his hands. So I think he wrote this thing in the early 30s. Excuse me? Question? Question? Yeah, and, w and it would have been, uh, uh, it was published, uh, it was copyrighted in the University of Michigan in 1932, and I think he wrote it sometime or in the right after his uh, exile. <laughs> Yeah. When you say he was in prison during this time, was this the Tsar's prison? Yes. Yeah, this is the Tsar's prison. Uh, he never had a party post. He really attended meetings. Uh, he was extraordinarily hard, as Lenin said, to work collectively with him. But he was talented, and there's no question about that. A powerful mind, um, a wonderful speaker, but um, a character if there ever was one. Now, you recall the last time I was uh, talking to you, I showed you a clip where, uh, from Dr. Zhivago, there was this character, Strelnikov, on the armored train. That was based on uh, Trotsky. Trotsky had a train like that, did run around uh, as he was in charge of the, uh, of the war on such a train, and he actually looked like that. Here are some pictures of Trotsky. Here he is in his, in his uh, armored train. And if you remember the picture of Strelnikov in that movie, uh, it resembles this uh, person. And you could see the kind of, um, let's call it sternness, and uh, a kind of off-putting in his face. At least that's the way I read his face, although I'm not the greatest reader of people. But uh, I wouldn't want to be confronted with this guy. Here he is again later on in peacetime. But again, it's that same piercing look that same imperious manner, uh, that same very tough character. OK, now during the Civil War, uh, these are the, uh, the leading people. Uh, Lenin, of course, uh, being in charge, uh, Trotsky in charge, Kamenev, who spent most of his time in Petrograd at the side of Lenin, uh, Bukharin, who was one of the younger members of the um, Bolshevik party. Uh, Bukharin had been um, in Vienna when Lenin sent uh, Stalin there in uh, the uh, 1912 period, when uh, he asked uh, Stalin to write a, a piece on the um, national question. Um, Lenin looked upon Stalin as the expert on the national question. Uh, once this uh, period uh, uh, that we're talking about today uh, unfolded, there was a question of how to, how to deal with the various nations that made up the Russian landscape. Uh, you had Turkmen's, you had uh, Georgians, you had Lithuanians, you had a whole host of different nation, uh, national groups. And Stalin's solution was not in favor of these people. He wanted them all amalgamated into Russia and given local autonomy. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, USSR, was Lenin's idea. And he imposed it on Stalin and the rest of the party, that they would be separate socialist republics. The second big thing to, be, to realize about this period of the, uh, of the Bolshevik uh, uh, development and of the, the Soviet development, and it's covered in the review paper that I passed out, is their um, their concern about whether they could sustain their state in the face of capitalist encirclement. 
As soon as the uh, armistice was signed in 1918, Lenin's biggest fear was that the capitalist parties would come together and press in and eliminate the socialist state. So there's always a question of, why did we make this revolution? And their thought was that the revolution was made in order to spark a revolution in the rest of the world. And that without a revolution in the West, they would fail. That they needed to spark a revolution in the West. And they had, uh, in 1918, as some of you may know, there was a revolution in Germany led by um, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, and that was suppressed in 1918 by the uh, Social Democratic Party, which was then in power. In 1923, a second communist revolution was attempted in Germany, which was also suppressed. There was a revolution in Romania, which was suppressed. Whatever revolutionary sparks became ignited right after the First World War were entirely suppressed. And the Soviet government, Lenin's government, had to confront the fact that they were alone in the world. That's the only socialist uh, state. Stalin, as you see on this uh, chart, had day-to-day -day management of the party, and I already described what that would mean in the struggle for power. The Orb Bureau was in charge of the party's personnel, and that was where Stalin had uh, great power. And he was the liaison officer between Politburo and the Orb Bureau. Okay? So um, while they didn't think much of him, maybe they thought he was a, a great blur, he was extremely powerful. Okay. Now, the NEP was resisted. Members, old Bolsheviks, who had been looking forward to the revolution all their lives, and now that it came about, greatly, greatly objected to the idea of going back to, to a capitalist phase. And Lenin was faced with holding the party together. And he looked to Stalin to take on the, the role of the general secretary in 1922. Lenin's health is going downhill at this time. Remember, he's not going to live past I think it was February 1924. And here we are, two years earlier, April 22, and he's making uh, Stalin uh, the general secretary. Back, and Stalin's uh, position is being supported by Kamenev. OK. In May 1922, right after this appointment, he has his first paralysis. He tries to come back to office. He has a second paralysis. They had uh, performed surgery to try to get the bullet out of his uh, throat, but it wasn't successful. And in 1922, at the end of 1922, he dictates his testament. Now, I'm going to be very careful with this. Don't let the NKVD catch you with this. <laughs> this is serious stuff. If this was found in your apartment, your testimony, if this was found in your apartment or your home, it was a straight ticket to the gulag. This is extremely hot. No kidding. It could cost somebody. Excuse me? When do we get those down here? I'll bring it to you next week, but you have to be careful with it, too. I'm saving your lives right now. OK, what this document says Okay, in 19, uh, and those of you up here are reading it, and uh, I'll read some of it to you down there. Uh, what Lenin did with this document is um, he assessed the people in the Politburo. He assessed the leaders, the various leaders of the, uh, of the Bolshevik Party. Among them, uh, Bukharin, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Trotsky, Stalin. And all of them are criticized. None of, none of them are good enough. And Lenin was aware that he was on the way out. Um, he then, a month after he gives this out, he dictates a postscript. In the postscript, he writes this, Stalin is too rude. And this failing, which is entirely acceptable in relations among us communists, is not acceptable in a general secretary. I therefore suggest that the comrades find a means of moving Stalin from this post 
and giving the job to someone else who was superior to Comrade Stalin in every way, that is, more patient, more loyal, more respectful, and attentive to their comrades, less capricious, and so on. These considerations may seem like a triviality, but I believe that from the point of view of preventing a split, and in view of what I said about relations between Stalin and Trotsky, it is not a trivial matter, or it is the kind of triviality which can assume decisive significance. Okay, this is really hot stuff. And yeah. stuff, yeah. Who did he hand this out to? He gave that to his wife, Krupskaya. And Krupskaya um, was supposed to give it out if he dies, and, she, and if he dies before the next uh, conference. And she does that. She does give it out. Now let me, let me talk a little bit about the circumstances as to what's going on here. Is that he's sick, okay? And the Bolshevik party, when you're sick, you're not in charge of yourself. They're in charge of you. There's the case of Frunz. When Frunz got sick, he had a stomach ulcer. He didn't want to go to the hospital. He was ordered to go to the hospital. And what do you know? He died on the operating table. And he didn't even have to take out the ulcer because it was scarred over. Uh, but anyway, Stal uh, Lenin is sick, and somebody from the party has to monitor this thing. And who do they give the job to? They give it to Stalin. This is a lousy job because Lenin has a wife, Lenin has a sister, Lenin himself doesn't want to be bossed around. And the doctors say he shouldn't work. Remember that remark? That's what they told Stalin. The doctors tell Lenin he's not to work too hard, and Lenin wants to work. So they start to undermine what Stalin is trying to do. Stalin's trying to do what the doctors say. He shouldn't work too hard. Lenin's trying to get some work done. Also wants to get involved in the party affairs. So Stalin is caught in the middle. It's really not, it's not a nice place to be, but there he is. And um, the uh, testament is, is um, read out. Stalin, uh, Lenin is in trouble. He reads it out to his secretary. He gives his instructions to Kupskaya. And along the way, there's arguments between Krupskaya and Lenin, uh, between Krupskaya, there would be that too, but between Krupskaya and Stalin. And there's more to this story. Let's see what happens next. Okay. This gets back to Lenin. And Lenin writes this letter to Stalin. You permitted yourself a rude summons of my wife to the telephone and a rude reprimand of her. Because he's arguing with her, I have to take care of him, and so on, and the doctor said this and that. Despite the fact that she told you she agreed to forget what was said, nevertheless, Zinoviev and Kamenev, these are going to be his rivals, heard about it from her. I have no intention to forget so easily that which is being done against me, and I need not stress here that I consider as directed against me that which is done against my wife. I therefore ask that you weigh carefully whether you're agreeable to retracting your words and apologizing, or whether you prefer the severance of our relationship. Okay, now you recall when I told you about Stalin's death, I told you that they carried out his desk and found three papers under a newspaper. And I told you I would tell you about those three as we came to it in our lecture. Well, this is the first of those three papers. He saved this letter and it was in his desk all the rest of his life. So you can imagine how this impacted him. And the testament was handed out. And those guys at the conference who got that testament were in danger of their lives for the rest of their lives because they had this and he knew that they had this. And this thing was suppressed, not this letter, but the letter certainly was suppressed but the testament that I handed out was suppressed in all that period. It was very dangerous, as I said, to have it. This is what Lenin looked like in the months before his final demise. Okay? By that, at that point, the, the testament had not come out, and the letter had not come out. And I read this to you, and I read you about the... Uh, uh, I didn't read down this at you folks down in South County. I didn't read the, the top bullet to you, 
Comrade Stalin, having become general secretary, has accumulated enormous power. It's, it's clear to Lenin that he's going, and he's trying to control things, but he can't do it. It must have been one hell of a year for Paul Lenin that last year. Comrades must find a way to remove Stalin from his post. Now, question? Yes, um, does this Stalin's stroke, I mean, this uh, Lenin's strokes and his deteriorating health pretty much directly tied to that gunshot wound? They don't directly tie it to the gunshot wound. I, I, I myself, in my readings, have been curious about the very same thing that you raised. And I don't find any author that ties it, but it seems to me that it is tied. Because the bullet goes into his throat, and I and I mean, those of you in the class who are physicians, and the rest of us, it just seems like common sense. But I don't know. I, I haven't found any anybody who said that it was directly tied. Now, he has to answer this. Lenin uh, dies. He's in a, a, a committee conference when the testament comes out, and this is what he says. It's said that in his testament, Lenin suggested that in view of Stalin's rudeness, the Congress should consider replacing him with someone else. That's absolutely true. Yes, comrades, I am rude towards those who rudely, treacherously destroy and split the party. I have never hidden this, nor do I now. Maybe a certain gentleness is required toward the splitters, but it's not like me to be like that. Now, in my reading and so on, I was struck by this thing, and I'm going to present this to you, because this, I'll come back to this in a minute, this thing is so much like the following. Richard III explains himself. You all know Richard III, you all remember him. Because I cannot flatter and speak fair, smile in men's faces, smooth, deceive, and cog, duck with French nods and apish courtesy, I must be held a rancorous enemy. Cannot a plain man live and think no harm, but thus his simple truth must be abused by silken sly insinuating jacks. They do me wrong, and I will not endure it. Is that the same person or not? Isn't that amazing? And it's the same, uh, as we go through this struggle for power, Remember Richard III, because his behavior, as we go through this, is uh, it's as though Shakespeare could see all the way through to the Soviet Union. OK. He's supervising medical illness. Uh, Lenin is working behind him to direct the party affairs. Krupskaya and Lenin's sister are helping Lenin. Uh, he reminds them, he sends them the letter. I could jump ahead later on after Lenin dies. Krupskaya, who, is an, who was a Bolshevik, she's been in the party struggles all this time. She's still trying to do something. At one point, and not at this point, but at one point, uh, Stalin leans across the table to her, and this is what he says to her. You know, we could always find another widow for Lenin. Can you believe that? <laughs> okay, now, uh, let me see, I have a clip, now I want to run a clip of, um, of the movie of Bob, before we get into this class. Uh, yeah. Could you set that up? <clears throat> that this testament was circulated. Yes. At the party. It was. Uh, it seems to have absolutely no effect whatsoever. Right. It doesn't have an effect. And the reason it doesn't have an effect is a testament to, well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, it's an attack on all of them, right? Trotsky is attacked also in this, in this thing. So they have a reason not to, um, not to really act on it. The bulk of the uh, people in the uh, party by this time, after the 200,000 have come in, uh, are new Bolsheviks whose uh, mentor, is no other than Iosif Vizoranovich. And this answer that uh, he gave seems to have worked for him. So yes, you're right. Lenin tried to get this done. If Lenin hadn't had the stroke, he probably would have 
what the guy had done. Things might have been different, and it's one of the considerations in our later discussion of why this turned out the way it did. Would have Lenin have made the difference? And that's one of the things that uh, Alexander uh, Rabinowitz discusses in, in his book and in his review. You'll see some discussion of this. Okay, so let me let me run this movie. This is a one-minute movie. There's Lenin in his uh, prime, and here uh, it says, "Oh yeah." So the, and here is the funeral. Uh, this is a movie that was made in 1934, after. Stalin's ascendancy to power. There's Stalin at the funeral. Um, the movie has many characteristics to it. I'm only showing you the piece that has to do with the funeral, so you get a feeling for what the funeral might have been like. That's Krupskaya. This is Krupskaya. We shall complete what you began, Ilyich. We shall complete what you began. Lenin was always known as Ilyich, V.I. Lenin. Vladimir Ilyich Ulanova, Lenin. And that's his tomb. Okay. All right, can we get back to the slideshow? Okay. Now, this movie is um, a movie I have in my library. It's called Three Songs of Lenin. I should bring some of those in. And, and uh, it was made in 34, but the clips that you saw were uh, clips from the, uh, from the funeral period. By 34, we'll be talking about that next week. Uh, that's after Stalin rises to power, and that's the beginning uh, that was the end of the first five-year plan, and in 34 was the murder of Kirov uh, and the beginning of the purge, the purge of the Bolshevik uh, party. So uh, that the movie was intended to support the propaganda of that particular period, and I have some additional clips to show you what that propaganda was like. But in 22, there was a triumvirate. Um, they had... Uh, uh, well, Trotsky would have been the natural, you would, if you had read John Reed's book, you would think Trotsky would be the successor. But uh, there was a lot of resentment of, uh, against Trotsky, and this, um, this group of people, uh, Stalin here, as you see, um, Kamenev here, this is Kamenev, and Zinoviev here. Rykov is a uh, secondary person. Okay, Kamenev is aligned with Stalin. Both Zinoviev and Kamenev hated Trotsky. Uh, given Trotsky's manner of characteristics and his background, it was not a surprise that people didn't like him. Um, but what did they think about Stalin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev, who had very high positions and were quite close to uh, Lenin? This is uh, Lev Kamenev in 1935. By this time, he had been almost before he was shot, uh, imprisoned and shot. Uh, this is Zinoviev. Uh, by the way, Kamenev was uh, Trotsky's brother-in-law. Uh, Kamenev uh, was an old friend of Stalin, but that never stopped Stalin. He wouldn't be a good guy to be a, either relative or friend. Uh, this is Zinoviev, great speaker, but they said he, well, he didn't have the strength of character to be a leader, what they said. They thought of Stalin as a mediocrity. They were the people who underestimated Stalin. They thought they were using Stalin because they were fighting against Trotsky. <coughs> but Stalin was using them. And after Trotsky was beaten, he destroyed the two of them. Stalin's image. And in the old days, the Marxist scholar Ryazanov said to him, stop it, Koba, don't make a fool of yourself. Everybody knows theory is not exactly a field. Luckily, as I mentioned before about Razanov, Razanovich died before Stalin could get his hands on him because he was an old guy. But if he had, Razanov would surely have paid for this from all. 
But Stalin was aware of this and resented it. Although, you have to look at it, as far as all the running around and all the activity that Stalin had put in as a bandit in the Caucasus, as uh, uh, robbing that, uh, that bank robbery in Tiflis, all the years in prison, all the running around during the Civil War, he, uh, in a way, paid a lot of dues to get where he was. The postscript, the party conference, they finally agreed not to read it out loud, but it had been distributed. The party can expel members for factionalism. Zinoviev attacks Trotsky, recommends arresting him. Stalin is holding back. Stalin is not in the forefront. He's a very, very clever politician. <coughs> See if I if I can get my hands on what the, exactly I wanted to read to you about. I, I guess I can't easily find. I don't want to spend a lot of time leafing through books. But there's a quotation where Stalin says, "I don't think it's a good idea to split the party. I don't think it's a good idea to prosecute too strongly." Trotsky had written a a, um, a book uh, called Lessons of October, pointing out that both Zinoviev and Kamenev had recommended against the coup d'etat against taking power in 1917. Uh, Trotsky had come into the Bolshevik party from the Menshevik group. <coughs> and uh, Stalin answers uh, uh, trying to establish his own uh, uh, credentials in four and three days as a uh, theoretician. He writes his book, The, Fo uh, the Focus uh, Foundations of Leninism. Now, this whole question of socialism in one country, Trotsky, arguing from Marxist theory, argues that it's necessary for um, the socialist state to continue to agitate for revolution outside of Russia. Uh, in 1923, they established the Comintern. Zinoviev is appointed the chairman of the Comintern. They are fomenting revolution, but on the same time, they're seeking a recognition from other countries. One of the interesting things in this period is that there was a conference of nations in Geneva on disarmament. But two countries who were pariahs in the world at the time, Germany and Russia, were not invited. So Germany and Russia send their foreign representatives to Apollo, Italy, not far I don't know if any of you have traveled around Italy. It's out there. It's near Geneva. It's down uh, on the uh, near Positano, down in that area. They go to Apollo, and they conclude a treaty in which the Soviet Union, who is not a signatory to the Versailles Treaty, agree to help Germany. They sell them arms. Germany trains their military in the Soviet Union. And there was an agreement where German uh, military would go to uh, Russia and train there, and that the Russians would also sell arms to them. That was in the 20s. That's before Hitler. There is a relationship between the Soviets and the Germans. At the same time, in China, there are uh, um, the, uh, the Soviet uh, are helping the uh, communist Chinese in their struggle with the Kuomintang. <clears throat> but there's, there's actually four different games being played by the Soviet Union at that time. They're in recognition with the legitimate government of China. They are also helping the Kuomintang, which are opposing the legitimate government of China at the time. They're also uh, helping the left Kuomintang, which are fighting with Kuo, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And they're also helping the communists within the left Kuomintang who are fighting with them. So they're playing a four-handed game all at the same time. But eventually, when Chiang Kai-shek turns against the communists, they back Chiang Kai-shek and stab Mao and the communists in the back. And it's considered a, uh, a, a, a scandal, and Zinoviev is heavily criticized for this. Also, there's a revolt in Germany, and uh, that was a a, re a revolt fails, and Zinoviev is criticized for that. And by 1925, Zinoviev is removed from leadership, Kamenev from the Moscow leadership, and the power is slipping away from Trotsky, 
and Zenobiev and, and Kamenev have supported and now slipping away from Zenobiev and Kamenev. And all by 25 or 26 falling into the hands or grabbed by the hands of the Yosef Zeranovich. Trotsky is removed from the war ministry. Trotsky did not use the Red Army. <clears throat> One of the things to remember is that these Bolsheviks were great students of the French Revolution. The French Revolution was considered the sine qua non of revolution at the time, up until the, uh, the October 1917. So whatever happened in the French Revolution was very well known to the Bolsheviks of the Russian uh, Revolutionary period. And Bonapartism, when Napoleon comes in and takes over, is the natural result of the French Revolution, which was feared by the Bolsheviks in Russia. So if Trotsky had tried to use the army, it would have been seen as a move for Trotsky to become the next Napoleon. And he refrained from doing that. Uh, the uh, way Stalin framed the uh, fight with Trotsky over socialism in one country, it made it look like, um, like uh, patriotism. You know, are we not strong enough to stand up to the capitalist world? Do we have to accept uh, Trotsky's formulation where we have to have a revolution in the rest of the world in order to survive? Uh, Zinoviev and Kamenev were attacking the NEP, the new economic policy. It wasn't Stalin's policy, but he was defending it. And they called it continuous retreat, because why aren't we becoming a socialist country as our revolution promised? So these were the fights at the time. Uh, Kamenev is demoted out of the Politburo. He, now he's only a candidate member. Uh, Molotov, Voroshilov, and Kalinin are made. These are all guys that are dependent on, on uh, Stalin. Uh, Voroshilov and Kalinin are coming out of the Caucasus. Uh, Molotov was always, from the moment that uh, Stalin came back from Siberia and took over as editor of Pravda, Stalin was always his uh, lapdog. Uh, Molotov was always his laptop. Lenin would refer to Molotov as Iron Ass because he had the capacity to sit in a chair all day long. <laughs> now, we haven't heard of Molotov before. You know, well, Molotov had been editor of Pravda while uh, 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 Stalin was in Siberia. At one point uh, in a meeting, uh, uh, it's known that Lenin passed a note to Molotov you're going to make a speech. Get up and make a strong speech. Tear up this note. In place of in place of Zenobia in uh, Leningrad, they send Kirov. Now, many of you have heard of Kirov. It's, the name is still around. The Kirov Ballet. They're a ballet troupe from Leningrad. They will play a very significant role in in this history. Uh, Trotsky is removed from the Politburo. Zinoviev, Zinoviev is removed from the com uh, Comintern. This idea of slowly, this salami tactic, <laughs> slice by slice of reducing somebody, this is the method that was used. When uh, in Stalin's last dinner, Molotov and McCoyan were not at that dinner. Molotov and McCoyan were not heads of ministry in the government. They were both fearful that Len that Stalin was about to give them the treatment that these guys are getting back here in 1924. There was a lot of reason to want Stalin dead at that point. That's why some people think he was poisoned and not a natural death. OK. Now, after fighting with Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev joined with him. So they think they're going to be stronger. But they're not stronger from this tactic. And they oppose the NEP. Okay. Now what's interesting about this, because next week I'm going to talk about this. Once Stalin gets into power, what do you think Stalin does with the NEP? He's fighting with them. He's defending the NEP here. He eliminates the NEP. Suddenly he's against the NEP. At this point, he's in favor of it. Bukharin says to the peasants in richer cells, I already talked about this and my analogy with the Chinese. 
Remember what I said, because I hope I'm not right, but I, I may I turn out to be right. Yeah. In other words, I see these communists in, in China becoming communists and coming back and ending their, their, their MEP in a, not in exactly the same way, but in somehow the way Stalin did the MEP of Russia. Trotsky fought, calls upon his fellows to follow uh, Clemenceau in case of war. Clemenceau uh, attacked the, uh, his predecessors and their failures in World War I, and it looks like treason in 1927. There's a war scare in 1927. Somehow the rumor gets around that Britain is going to attack the, uh, the uh, Soviet Union, um, and there's a brief war scare. Uh, they call the, uh, the Politburo Thermidorism. Anybody have any idea what thermidorism refers to? It does refer to heat. It's a phrase from the French Revolution. At the time of the French Revolution, because they, the French uh, revolutionaries of that period felt that they were entering a new age, they changed the calendar. And they were now going to count it from year one so that the first year of the French Revolution was year one officially in France and all succeeding years. They also changed the names of the months. They were old, and now we're going to have a new period. So uh, virginal or something like that was April, and Thermidor was July, and there was another different name for August, and there was a different name for every month of the year. And they were very poetic, and I can't remember what they were, except for Thermidor. Because in July of uh, 1798, they beheaded um, Robespierre. And that was the move to the right. With the beheading of Robespierre, the French Revolution now moved to the right and finally ended with the ascendancy of Napoleon. There's an interesting book, I didn't bring it along with me, by an author named Crane Britton, uh, called Anatomy of Revolution. In this book, he examines four revolutions, the Cromwell Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and looks for similarities in these four. And what Crane Britton sees is that revolutions begin in the center and move inexorably toward the left until they reach an extreme and then move again back to the right. And the move to the left in Crane Britton's analysis of the French Revolution is to this Thermidor when Robespierre is beheaded. And from that point, the revolution moves back to the right. And these people, although they weren't reading Crane Britain, but they were aware that in Thermidor, uh, Robespierre was killed, and they don't want that to happen to their revolution. So they call the MET Thermidorism, degeneration, Menshevism, which is uh, uh, compromising and uh, holding back on the uh, advent of uh, socialism, communism, betrayal, etc., and against the Chinese Revolution. Not only that, but you can imagine how different the Soviet Union of this period was when, when the eventual Soviet Union, because they organized a march on the 10th anniversary of the revolution. But as a result, of, I mean, they had a protest march in the Soviet Union. That was the last time that happened. The three of them are removed from the party. And so Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Trotsky um, are um, confined, as Trotsky once yelled at the Mensheviks who left one of the meetings in protest. He said, go, go to the dustbins of history. And so these three guys went themselves into the dustbin of history. So this was the contest. Uh, as we have just uh, reviewed it. Can you build socialism in, uh, do you have to wait for the workers of the West to revolt? And Stalin says we can't wait. And Trotsky says you can't because the peasants will resist it. And Stalin says uh, we will change the peasants. And Trotsky says no. We have to hope for world revolution. But Stalin changes the peasants. And that's the subject of next week's lecture. Next week we'll look at how Stalin addressed the peasants and what happened to the peasants. The great man-made famine 
And we'll look at how Stalin changed the party with the murder when, when Kirov was murdered in 1924. And who killed Kirov? And we'll talk about who killed Kirov. You can imagine what my answer is going to be. It's an interesting question. Okay, so we'll stop here and take any questions. Yes, yes sir. Now, uh, Trotsky at one time ruled the uh, head of the, the Red Army. Who did? Trotsky. Trotsky, yes. But was he a military man, per se? He was not, Mr. Miller. He was a lawyer. But he was a good military man, as you can imagine. And he didn't try to use the army itself for his for power. He sh he might have gotten away with it, but it, it would have it would have looked like, and maybe would have felt like, Bonapartism, and they would not go down that route. Yes. I think you said the uh, union of autonomous republics was Lenin's idea. Yes. What was Stalin? Stalin wanted all of these nations, all of these independent republics, merged into the uh, Russia, and that Russia would be uh, not not even as uh, as free as an American states, but uh, be sort of autonomous to the groups where they could take control of only very local matters. And then Lenin was not in favor of that. I mean, essentially, they didn't have much freedom. Once he became the uh, ruler of Russia, that's pretty much what they were anyway. They had no freedom under Stalin. Now they claim it's an independent nation and so on. But had Stalin gotten his way, that may not have happened. Any questions down there in South County? Yes, Stan. Yeah. If Trotsky was uh, uh, Anxious to get power, why was he against Bonapartism? It, it was. It would have benefited him. Yeah, right. If if that was the only, I guess, I guess he had principles of some sort. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Well, they were wedded to the idea of communism and socialism, and they have their ideas. Some of them are kind of. Uh, well, we would. I wouldn't use the word goofy, but it was their way of looking at the world. So. It would have been a betrayal of his principles. Yes? One of the curious things that comes back was the famine began because they were not able to harvest the grain and get it transported. Correct. That still prevailed after Stalin's death. They, it was only, I would say, in the last 15 years that they were able to feed the country. Famine, to keep people, I think, wasn't it Stalin's idea? You move a country on their feet, but keep them hungry. Yeah, I'm not sure I've heard that yes, before. Yes, yes. Well, I, I would imagine that to be that. Well, we wonderful. went out to the Ukraine and we saw all of this, yeah. and it was most interesting yeah. at this time. The grain was there. Yeah. But they could not transport it. Transport was a big factor. A vast factor. nation. This is a tremendously. And vast it still country. prevails today. I wouldn't be surprised. But didn't Stalin intentionally starve the Ukrainians? Yes. To, to well, the point where they, they would yeah. shoot people who were cleaning. Yeah, and I'll talk about that next time. They did. They did intentionally. They didn't really want to starve them, but they wanted what they were after. And you couldn't stop them. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, well, keep the faith. I'll see you next time.